Peshem Hashem Naase Venasliyah. So, a um, few weeks before uh, Purim, we're going to do Halachot Purim. So, starting with what's, what's coming up um, as soon, soon, which is Parashat Zachor, which is this Shabbat, for those of you in LA, 2019. This uh, Shabbos, we like to make everyone feel comfortable here. <laughs> <laughs> this Sabbath coming up in shuls near you. Parashat Zachor. So, Parashat Zachor is what? He, Shlosha Pesukim Acharonim Shel Parashat Ki It's three Pesukim, the end of Parashat Ki that discuss what? Discuss the mitzvah of erasing the name of Amalek from earth. Let me give you a little lesson about what Amalek is. Amalek was a nation, is a nation, that basically hated the Jews from the beginning of the Jewish nation, even before the Jews became the Jewish nation, before receiving the Torah. The Jews just got uh, the Exodus. Exodus happened, the Jews come out of Egypt, right? And as Rashi says it, Rashi explains like this, why is it that in our Torah we have a commandment to destroy Amalek? We don't have a commandment to destroy any other nation that has made us suffer. Not the Egyptians, not the Amorites, not the Moabites, none of them. Some of them were not allowed to marry them anymore because of tendencies of their, their culture and or, 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 or characteristics. Even Egyptians, three generations after they convert, then you can marry into Egyptians also. I mean, they literally killed children, women for generations, for 210 years, they made Jews suffer. But we don't have a mitzvah to erase them. We don't have a mitzvah to kill them, nothing. Amalek we do. What did Amalek do? When the Jews came out of Egypt, and the, as the Pasuk says, you were tired from your travels, they attacked you. They attacked. They lost. But however, after that, Hashem says, destroy them. Why? What was different? <laughs> <laughs> what was different about what <laughs> Amalek did than any other nation, right? I'm sure you have the same question. That's why I'm posing this question right now. So there's many answers, few answers. <coughs> Let's think about it. And I want you to think about it and see if you agree with me. How did the Jewish nation leave Egypt? Did we escape? No. How did we leave Egypt? With our heads high. What? With our heads high. With our heads high. I mean, like, more than heads high. Not only did we not escape, we owned it. Like a boss. Okay. Like a boss, exactly. Paro came at night, then he's like, okay, you're free to go. Go, please go. You know what Moshe did? Moshe's like, nah. We're going to go tomorrow morning. You know why? Because if we go now, people are going to say we ran away at night. We want daylight. We want everyone to know that we did not escape. We left on our own. And we waited until Egypt was no more, until you gave up. That's when we left. So we left, heads high. What happened exactly? For 12 months straight, 10 plagues hit Egypt like no other plague in history. And I could actually say that, it never happened again. These 10 plagues destroyed Egypt fully. And they were all miraculous. No one argued that they're not miraculous. Everybody understood, why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu would come to Paro and be like, hey, let the Jews go. Uh, no. Okay, if you don't let the Jews go, tomorrow you're going to have locusts attack Egypt. What would happen tomorrow at the time and date Precisely, locusts would attack. And then he would say, I'm sorry, I'll let you Jews go. Moshe would pray, boom, it would stop. Over and over, for an entire year, 12 months, this went on. Plague started when Moshe said so, and they stopped when Moshe said so from the word of God. So everybody knew that it's the Jews doing this through God. No one would argue the fact that Jews had God on their side. And then, it's not done yet, we leave. We come out, Egyptians, 
start following us, they run after us to kill us or bring us back to Egypt. What happens then? The greatest miracle that has happened in history of humankind. Kriyat Yamsuf. The Yamsuf splits, the Jews go right in the middle, <clears throat> and the Midrash says, it wasn't just the Yamsuf that split, all the waters all over the world split. So if anyone would ever ask what happened, people would say, oh, by the way, in Egypt on the Yamsuf, right by Israel, the sea split, the Jews went in, Egyptians went in after them, the ocean closed on top of them. So it was like a historical, like it, it, it made a boom sound. Imagine it was on every single person's Twitter and Facebook account on this, at the same time. I'm like, hey, did you hear what happened? Yeah, dog. And it was like thumbs ups for like the Jews and like sad faces and angry faces. Amalekites are like, you know, like those Jews. But everybody knew what happened. How did you think? How do you think the world felt about this now that all of this happened? How do you think the world felt about the Jews? Scared. 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 Like, forget scared, bro. They were terrified. I mean, don't touch the Jews, don't go near them, leave them alone. Just like uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the first temple, he didn't want to do it. He literally had his arm twisted to go destroy the temple because he knew he had seen with his own eyes what, what happens to people that mess with the Jews. He's like, I'm not conquering Jerusalem. I'm leaving them out, leave me alone. That's a long story as to what took place for him to actually come and destroy the temple. But he didn't want to do it in the beginning. Because he was terrified. He knew what the Jews have behind them. They have a strong God. So what happens? No one, once the Jews left Egypt, nobody wanted to mess with the Jews. Nobody. Except Amalek. All of a sudden a nation comes and says, You know what? We can beat them. We'll fight them. Yeah, we're going to do it. And they fought. And they lost. But like Rashi says, you know what that did? It was like a tub filled with hot boiling water that no one wanted to go into. But as soon as a few people jump in, the water gets cooled off. Even though those first few died because it was boiling hot water, but now the water is cooled off because of them. So everybody else can jump in. That's what happened. You know what that is? That's a prime example of what? Atheism. Amalekites were the first atheists. The entire world was petrified by the Jews because their God is strong. Their God is mighty. Don't mess with the Jews. That was the message of the entire world. Why? Because didn't you see what happened in Egypt? Didn't you see all the miracles? Didn't you see the plagues? Didn't you see the ocean splitting up? Comes Amalek and says what? Ah, coincidence. These things happen all the time. It's a freakish accident. So it happened. It just so happened it was really windy that night. So the ocean split. Ah, grasshoppers were hungry. It happens. Frogs? Yeah, it was an attack of frogs. I don't know. It was from the Nile River. Whatever you could come up with. What did that do? That ruined it for everybody else. So it was as if Hashem is saying, I could, I could deal with people that are idolaters. They worship idols. But at least they believe in something. They believe there is a moral code. There is something there. But Amalek just believes in nothing. Everything is an accident. That's dangerous. When someone believes in nothing, there is no hope. It's dangerous. Because, hmm, why should I care? Everything's an accident. Everything goes, whatever, you know. So why not fight them? That's why we have a mitzvah in the Torah. And the mitzvah is, midah <clears throat> oraita, that every man has to hear the parasha of Zachor, which is just three pesukim at the end of parashat ki tetzeh, once a year. And the Chachami made a decree that that once a year should be the week before Purim. Why? Because Haman, who wanted to annihilate the Jews, 
was from the Zera of Amalek. He was from the children of Amalek. That's why he wanted to kill the Jews. We've been enemies from day one. <coughs> Therefore, Chachamim decreed that it should be read before Purim because it's connected. So, and you so now, halacha is, each person has to have kavana. When we come to shul to listen to parashat zachor, we have to have kavana. How? Which means we have to have in mind that when the chazan is reading the Torah portion of Amalek, he's reading it for us. Really, I have to be reading it from the Sefer Torah for myself. But we have an appointed shaliach. He's an appointed person by us. He's going to read for us. And the chazan at the same time, vice versa, has to have kavana that he's doing it for everybody else. And it's important that not a sound is made because we have to listen to every single word and follow along in a chumash. Because if we miss a couple of words, we're not going to be yotzer. We're not going to have, we're not, we're, we've, not, um, we've not done our obligation. We've not fulfilled our obligation of listening to Parashat Zachor. And we have to make sure that the Sefer Torah that it's being read from is a kosher mehudar, which means the best kind of Sefer Torah. I mean, the best Sefer Torah you have in a Beit Knesset and a Shul, that's the one you should use. <clears throat> okay. Cholet. Let's say somebody, so now we know that it's a Midor Raita for everybody to come to Shul to listen to Parashat Amalek. Now, let's say someone's sick and they can't come to Shul. They can't make it. Tov lefachat sheikra et hapesukim shel Parashat Zachor v'chumash. It's good at least that if they're even at home, they have their own chumash at home. Even though it's not the class from a Sefer Torah, they should read Parashat Zachor for themselves from a chumash at home. <coughs> and he should tell himself that Bezrat Hashem, when he gets better, when it comes time that the, actually the Torah portion reaches Parashat Ki which is not right now, it's later on, he'll come to shul during Parashat Ki and listen to that last part when they read it and have kavana, that I'm doing my obligation of listening to Parashat Zachor in Parashat Kitetze itself. <coughs> that they can do. Now, Benes Sefarad and Ashkenaz. You, let's say you have, you're an Ashkenazic person and you usually go to a Sephardic shul on Shabbat because it's the closest one to you. Or you're Sephardi and you go to an Ashkenaz shul. When it comes to Parashat Zachor, because it's Midoraita, you should try your best to go to a synagogue that does the ta'amim and does the reading of the Torah according to your custom. Because it's midoraita. I remember when I was, when I was in yeshiva, <laughs> I was in an Ashkenazic yeshiva, which I owe a lot to. Um, uh, in our yeshiva, when it came to Parashat Zachor, the rabbi would announce. First, they would do the regular reading, the Ashkenaz reading. Then he would announce... That now for the Sephardic Bacharim that needs to be yotzed to listen to the, uh, to, and do their, fulfill their obligation of listening to Parashat Zachor <coughs> in their Sephardic dialect, we have a Sephardic reader. And for the years that I was in Yeshiva, I, I was actually honored with the, with the task of reading Parashat Zachor with the Tamim. So those that are Sephardic would also fulfill, fulfill their obligation. Nashim, are... How about like a uh, What? How about the who doesn't have... A Certain. Even about shuva, uh, even about the shuva, they have something that they're comfortable with. That they're so that's they to be, they <coughs> whatever they've chosen to be. That's what they're used to now. That's a more complicated. If the Ashkenaz and they choose to be Sephardi. It's not that simple. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. We don't just take people in just like that. There's a pro. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 if you ask me, I'm Mahmer. I'll be like, listen to both. Do tshuva for for. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what? What if you're traveling? Can you listen to before, like on Thursday? <clears throat> no, it has to be done <coughs> on Shabbat. On Shabbat. Anyway, why would you be traveling on Shabbat? It's Shabbat. Shabbat. Like I don't know. There's no shul in your Right, so that's what I'm saying. Um, it's very important. Because it's Midoraita, it's a Torah law. Whatever it is that you need to be doing, you have to make sure that you, you plan around this. That this week is Parashat Zachor, so I have to be in an area that has Parashat Zachor. Even people, there are people that live like, let's say, in the valley. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I just. Uh, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and they have to tend to their sheep. <laughs> I'm just. I don't know why I'm in this mood tonight. Um, so it actually says people that live on farms, places that they don't have. A... <laughs> okay. No, this is this is for reals now. Okay, for reals. People that live on farms and they're not near a synagogue, they have to plan accordingly for the Shabbat of Parashat Zachor to be uh, in a place in town, right? To be able to go and listen to Parashat Zachor, right? Or to make a minyan somewhere and to listen to it. And uh, you don't technically need a minyan. If someone has a Sefer Torah and they don't have a minyan, you could say Parashat Zachor on the, on the right time. You'll just read those three Pesukim without somebody making a Baracha Torah. What? The, 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 not from a chumash. The actual obligation has to be done from a kosher sefer toire. Has to be done. Or a sefer Torah. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Where you're from. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> no. Ricola. <laughs> <laughs> so, nashim, women. You know, you know, you know about uh, that kind of species. Women. <laughs> <laughs> they live everywhere. <laughs> Nashim. The better halves of everybody. That's for the video. <laughs> Nashim, women. Because there is a Discussion whether women are actually chayav midoraita to listen to parashat zachor. Why is it a why is it a, 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 a um, safek? Why is it a, a, a not clear cut whether women are obligated midoraita or not? From the one hand, we have a rule that right any mitzvah. You're wearing a suit. Don't talk. Any mitzvah. That is time bound, women are patur. No, right? Positive, positive, yeah. Positive, positive mitzvot yeah. that are time bound, women are patur from. So Parashat Zachor is time bound. It has a certain time of year that we do Parashat Zachor. And because it's time bound, so women are patur. But I, we also have something, a rule that says if they were also involved in this mitzvah or in this whatever, the, like this is Purim, right? And and Haman wanted to kill who? Men, women, children, everybody, right? So they were also involved in this personally. So women were also included in it. So they're also high up to do it. But it's but, not about Purim. Ah, but the other side is. But this is not about Purim. No, this is just Sakhar. Like, it still makes sense because <clears throat> they wanted to destroy. They wanted to destroy women too. Yeah. Uh, right. So it makes sense. So now because of the suffix. What do we do? Now, for instance, like, uh, think about <coughs> Chanukah. Chanukah, women are obligated. Why? Because they were also in the mitzvah of Chanukah. Because the decrees of the, of the Greeks were also on the women. And plus, the nests happened through a woman on Chanukah. And on Purim, the nests happened through a? A woman. That's also for the video. No, it actually happened. To... <laughs> oh, I'll say it right now. Here. So, a woman that could actually make it to shul and listen to Parashat Zachor, she should do so and she shall be blessed for it. Ah. But if a woman, it's hard for her to come. She's got children cl climbing and crawling all over the walls. She just can't make it. She can't do it. Or she's pregnant. Or whichever. For whatever reason. She can't do it. She can't. She has what to rely on. She has what to rely on. If she chooses not to go, she does have what to rely on. Because there's a tad, there's a side that says she's not chayav to listen to Parashat Zachor. However, in many shuls like us here at Netzach, we do two different times. So in the afternoon, we have another Zachor reading for the women so that the men could go home, take care of the family or whatever it is, so that the women can come to shul and listen to Parashat Zachor. So they, if they are chayav, they'll be able to fulfill their obligation as well. Uh, 
Especially if women have little children and they'll, they'll be forced to go to shul to listen to Parashat Zahor with their little children, they should not. Because what's going to happen if those little children are going to make noise and make it so that other people are not going to be able to do their obligation, that's even worse. Right? You can't force a mitzvah. You have to understand. Osek ba mitzvah, patur mina mitzvah. A person that's, uh, that's um, busy doing one mitzvah is patur from another mitzvah. So a woman that's tending to her children, she's doing a mitzvah. That's her mitzvah, right? That's the greatest mitzvah you could possibly do. So she's completely patur from doing another mitzvah. She didn't say, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'll, I'll do both. She doesn't have to. Don't drive yourself crazy over it. Because you're doing your own mitzvah, you're patur from another mitzvah. That's how the halakha is built in for women. <laughs> And they should try. Those women that do come to Bet Knesset, they should obviously, you know, they should be uh, respectful to the synagogue in any way they can, so that they're not coming to do a mitzvah and do an avar at the same time. What about a single dad? What about it? <clears throat> That's a good question. But because the single dad actually does have, there's no safek. There is no, there is no um, um, question whether he is obligated to do so or not. His obligation is for sure. Therefore, he should try his best to find a babysitter or something from beforehand so that he can make it. If there is absolutely no way, okay, it's just like a chole, a person that's sick. You know, so find another way to listen to it in parashat ki tetzeh. But he, there is no question that he's obligated. And I'm sure, he, uh, you know, uh, there's ways people help. Okay. Um, okay. Let's. <coughs> okay. Another mitzvah. We'll go for another five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh, um, the, um, it was. Um, her name was. By the time of the Greeks. Yehudit. It happened by Yehudit that she fed the uh, thing, uh, cheese and milk and things like that, and then, right? So the miracle came through Yehudit. I don't know. I don't know the details. I didn't watch the movie. So uh, there's also Machatit <laughs> Hashem. Uh, you are dark. Uh, so we also have a mitzvah Machatit Shekel. Before Purim, we have a mitzvah of giving the half shekels, the machatzit shekel, which was at the time, what was the machatzit shekel? People gave machatzit shekel, half a shekel coins, to the Beit HaMikdash, for what? So that the Beit HaMikdash will be able to, it was tzedakah. It was money so that the Beit HaMikdash could pay for buying the korbanet tamid, the tamid korbanot that they were going to bring in the Beit HaMikdash every single day. But however, because of our sins, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash today, but the mitzvah of Machatzit HaShekel is still around. Therefore, we do not give a Machatzit HaShekel, but what do we do? We, gave, we give Zecher la Machatzit HaShekel, which, which means in remembrance of the Machatzit HaShekel. So today, and it goes according to the price of silver. So today I checked, Machatzit HaShekel, half a shekel, would come around to around $6. <laughs> So you can't no. give more than that? You can. You can give more than $6. It's tzedakah because today, the money is supposed to go to yeshivas, to batek That's where the money should go to. So when you give machatzit shekel, it should be minimum $6. Of course, if somebody can't afford it, they can either give a, even give a quarter. Because the mitzvah of machatzit shekel today is in remembrance. Right? But everybody, Baruch Hashem, could afford $6. You give $6 and you say, Zecher la machatzita shekel. This is in remembrance of the chatzi shekel, the half shekel that they used to give in the Beit HaMikdash. And, what? Uh, the best is before Purim, right? But you could do it on the day of Purim also. So before Purim? The day before Purim, yeah. March 24th is good too. <laughs> 
Is it the best way you can eat it like today or tomorrow? Yes, the, the day start the the time starts mid Rosh Chodesh Adar. From Rosh Chodesh Adar, time starts when you have two Adars, right? The second Adar, the second Adar. So right now we're in Rosh Chodesh Bet. Uh, right now we're in um, Adar Bet, the second Adar. So Rosh Chodesh already passed. So the mitzvah Machatzat Hashem has already started. So you could give it now, okay. right? <coughs> Is it the best to give it before the Megillah read? Um. No, it says lefachot. You should try at least to give it before the reading of the Megillah. I think that just happens because people are just late, like me. A lot of times, I, I, I keep saying, "Oh, I, I want to bring for the whole family. I want to get from that," and it just becomes late. But we should try to give it as soon as possible. What from what age do we give? <clears throat> really, the age should be twenty and up. But we are machmir, and we do 13 and up. Any 13-year-old and up should give machasit shekel. <coughs> and I told you the amount. And I told you where it goes. Okay, one more minute. Do a f- maybe one or two more. It have to be in a certain, like, you know, some schools have, like, an actual designated place for machasit shekel. Or can it be in like, a place that's <coughs> Any tzedakah box. It just has to go to yeshiva or bet Knesset or something like that. I think all the tzedakah boxes go to the same place. Right. But they just make that marker so that people remember that I have to pay my machazit shekel. Is the fast, the fast, is it one of those you can't wash your hands? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Uh, if you're forced to brush your teeth, you can. It's better not to brush your teeth. But if you really need to because you're an important person, which you're not, (laughs) (laughs) if you have meetings and things like that you have to take care of, you keep your head down so that the water doesn't go in and you brush your teeth, right? But everything else, washing your face, taking a shower, all these things you can do on Tani Tester, especially Tani Tester. Uh, Why? Because Tani Tester is a fast unlike other fasts. Other fasts are because of sadnesses and tragedies. Tani Tester is actually a happy fast. We do it in remembrance of the chaste Hashem, of the miracles of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and what He did for us, our nation, over 2,000 years ago. Therefore, the fast of Esther's rules are a little simpler. You wear what? leather. Huh? You wear leather. Yeah, all the leather. You could, uh, everything you could do on a regular day, except drink and eat. Right? right? For Tani Tester. I think we, we, we covered um, some of uh, Tanit. <coughs> everybody, everybody is chayav for Tanit Esther. Everybody is obligated to fast Tanit Esther, men and women, anybody above the age of 13 or women above the age of 12. However, this is importante. However, chole, someone that's sick, Patur Melitanot, they are patur, they're not obligated to fast this fast. And they are not allowed to be stringent upon themselves. No, I want to fast. Don't do it. I was acting. If, if you're not feeling well, if the person has a flu or, a, you know, they shouldn't fast. They're not allowed to fast. Now, if uh, uh, someone that's old and they're fragile or they're frail because of old age, they're all patur from this fast. If your eyes hurt and you have a bad headache and you don't want to fast, now that's different. You cannot fast, but you'll have to make up the fast at another time that you're feeling better and stronger. Right? For that, you do have to fast, but you have to do a, uh, you don't have to fast, but you, didn't, you do have to make a, do a makeup tanis. Tanit later. Um, pregnant women for, for 24 months that they're breastfeeding and while they're pregnant, <clears throat> they don't have to fast. It's from. However, when we say pregnant women, it's from three months and up. They're three months pregnant and up, they don't have to fast. But earlier, you would have to fast. Mikol Makom, however, but if they're, they're feeling weak, like I think Chaham agreed today that most women are very fragile, very, very frail when it comes to pregnancy, things like that. Even before three months, they're patur from, especially from this fast. They don't have to fast if they feel like, you know, 
they're too weak for it. And usually women, unfortunately, we, uh, you know, our strengths have gone down dramatically from hundreds of years ago. So they should take care of themselves, especially if they're, if, if they're pregnant. So we will hold the halachot here, Bezrat Hashem, until next week we'll follow through with halachot of Purim, right before Purim. Um, so just wanted to share a few words of the Musar aspect of um, <clears throat> our shir tonight. I read a story that I think, I, I just, when I read it, I was like, uh, wow. <clears throat> there was a man called Iser, Rip Iser, and he had a store, a merchandise store, and he did well. He did okay. You know, this is hundreds of years ago. <laughs> Bless you. He had a minhag. And the minhag was that for Shabbat, instead of closing shop two hours before Shabbat, one hour before Shabbat, like cutting it like... He had a minhag that early afternoon, he shut down his store and he went home to get ready for Shabbat. And he did it for that reason. In order to be ready for Shabbat, he would close down <coughs> and we go do his shopping, help his wife, clean the house, do some learning, prepare for the acceptance of Shabbat Kodesh. That was his minhag. Yeah, you couldn't break it. One time, some uh, lord or something comes to his store and he comes a little early, but he had a lot of shopping to do. By a lot, I mean he was loading up a truck. This merchandise, 100 of this, 200 of that, 300 of this, 500 of that. And he was loading and loading and loading. Rabbi Sir looks at his watch and he realizes it's coming time and he wants to shut down. He wants to close up. And he tells him, I'm sorry, I have to close down in five minutes. So if you can be finished. He's like, what are you talking about? Like, I have so much more. Like, uh, and he looks at him like, I'm doing you a favor over here. Like, what are you talking about? He says, I'm sorry, I have to shut down. And he even tells him, it's like, it's not even close to your Sabbath. You don't, like... He doesn't listen. Comes five minutes and says, I'm really, really sorry. I have to close up. So he says, what am I going to do? With we have to leave it. So the guy gets upset. And he says, you know what? Forget about it. And he leaves. Thousands of dollars loss. He gives because of this business deal. Because of Shabbat. Was he upset about it? No. This was his thing. This was his uh, kavod of Shabbat. The respect of Shabbat. Chachamim say... Because of that. And it, there's no story of like, oh, he made it up next week. Or another customer came and he bought billions of dollars. None of that. Okay? So let me like, I'm going to do it so I can become rich. None of that happened in this story. <laughs> Much more than that happened. You know who his son became? The Ramah. Rav Moshe Israelish. The Ramah. You know, the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch that we, that we rely on for all of our halachic, uh, all of the halacha is in the Shulchan Aruch. The Ramah is what the Ashkenazim follow, which is put into the Shulchan Aruch in Rashi writing for the Ashkenazim to know their customs. He was a Mekubal, he was a Kabbalist, he was one of the greatest. You know how great he was? Let me just explain. This is, I think if you want to know how great the Ramah was, I think this, this, is, this tells you how great he was. Okay. The Shulchan Aruch has been written somewhere else by a Sephardic rabbi. Right? By the Maran Bet Yosef. And, and he's writing the Shulchan Aruch. The Ramah, at the same time, wanted to write such a Sefer, but there was no connection between the two. It's not like he knew there was no internet, like so and so is writing a book of law. He wanted to write the same type of thing halachot, laws. How do you follow? There was no such thing at this time. Do you understand? There's no straightforward, how do you do this, how do you do that halakha book. He wants to write it. Lo and behold, he realizes, he finds out that the Maran Bet Yosef in so-and-so place just published something called the Shulchan Aruch. What does he do? He gets a hold of it and he's like, wow, this is a masterpiece. But I have to do for the Ashkenazim. So I'll publish another book, 
and I'll call it something else. Kimin Hak Ashkenaz. Does he do that? No. What does he do? He says, this book is pe perfect. The Sefer is perfect. Why would I go and put my name on another book and make another book? I will just take the same book and add the Ashkenazic Minhagim in between the lines. That's called being L'Shem Shamayim. That's Gadlut. That's greatness. That's greatness. Not to want, oh, I have to do my book. I don't like that. It's like, huh, I wanted to do this Baruch Hashem. Someone did it. I'll just add the customs. It's a magnificent work of art. I'll just add my own customs of the Ashkenazim. That's what the Ashkenazic world follows. Chachamim said, you know what gave the father the zuchut that he had such a son? Kavot Shabbat. Forget about not being Mechalel Shabbat. We're not talking about not transgressing Shabbat. That for sure he wasn't doing. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about when he was able to work, he decided on Friday afternoon, from this time, I'm done. Why? I want to prepare myself for the kavod of Shabbat, for the respect of Shabbat. You wouldn't do that if you knew the president is coming to visit? You wouldn't do that if you knew a lord is coming to visit you? You wouldn't hurry up to finish everything up so you can go get ready and take a shower, shave, and make everything? You would. Anybody would. So we have to do the same thing for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for the Shekhinah. Every Shabbat, the Shekhinah visits. When we say Lecha Dodi, that's what we're doing. We are welcoming the Shekhinah, we're welcoming Shabbat. How much Zakhur it has to have the Kavod of Shabbat, to do things Lichvot Shabbat Kodesh? Especially since it's in Halakha that says, if you work, you have to make sure two hours before Tzedek Kuchavim, you have to stop, which is nightfall. Two hours before nightfall, you have to stop working. And it says, Anybody that works and makes money within those two hours will never see any blessing, any bracha from that money. Because you're not working on Shabbat. Forget that money, chas v'shalom. This is working two hours before nightfall, which is still not Shabbat at all. But when you're working, making money at that time, you should know there's no bracha in that money. Because at that time, at least, you're that... To our point, you should be giving yourself time to get ready for Lichvot Shabbat Konish. But Rav Isser was doing even more than that. Hours before, he would prepare himself Lichvot Shabbat Konish. I hope you take away something from this. That comes Friday afternoon, if you have that extra time and say, you know what, Lichvot Shabbat, I want to put my work away, my job away, and I'm going to actually start working on getting ready for Shabbat. And this is only, uh, it's only your actual job. You could do other melachot, but if you have an office, or you work somewhere, you should leave yourself that much time to get out. And in the zikhut of Shabbat, I mean, how much, how, what, what bigger blessing can we ask for than to have children that make Am Yisrael proud? What other blessing is there? I mean, to have your children to, to be a part of, uh, to become something bigger than you, it's the greatest blessing you could anyone, anyone could ever ask for. Baruch Adonai le'olam, amen va'amen.